Uh, I have uh, a short time, so I'm going to plunge straight in. I've got two brief preliminary points, three somewhat fuller comments about the developments that have taken place in my adult lifetime, and then my main contribution today, I think, four points that attempt to retrieve a biblical and Christian view of public life and of the tasks of the church and media within that. So I've only got three sections, but they subdivide. So, yeah, I have got seven points, which is too much, but there we are. Um, <clears throat> First preliminary point, I have been out of public life for six years now, so and no doubt that will show. I've kept my eye on some things, but I'm not being briefed every day as once I was. I have plunged back rather into the world of the first century in the firm belief that the better we understand the New Testament in its own context and culture, the more we shall at least raise the right questions about how to live by it in tomorrow's world. But for this reason, it wouldn't surprise me if I appear somewhat behind the game in some practical and contemporary issues. We shall see. <coughs> Second preliminary point, in a short presentation, I'll sometimes have to talk about, quote, the media, unquote. You know and I know that that phrase covers not only a good many disparate fields, from glossy magazines to blog sites and beyond, but also includes people who themselves differ radically in their views about everything, but not least in their view of what the role of the media might be. I've had various bit parts in the media over the years, from little bits of broadcasting here and there to occasional op-eds in um, newspapers and so on. So if the media constitutes a problem, I'm probably a little bit part of that myself. And so though brevity requires generalization, I will try at least to hint at the nuance which you will all sense behind it. It's kind of advanced apology, just in case anyone feels I'm treading on their toes. So to my three more substantial comments about where we've got to and how we've got there. First, rather obviously, but necessarily, we have in my lifetime witnessed the subtle but powerful shift from high modernity to what some call late modernity and others call post-modernity. Hard to define, of course, but quite easy to recognize. The hermeneutic of suspicion, the death of the meta-narrative, whether political or social or religious, the deconstruction of the self. Perhaps the best example swirled around the Diana tragedy in 1997, where the fairy tale turned into a nightmare, steered if not driven by some of the media. Likewise, a post-rationalist world we are now in, which sometimes retains the form of reasoned argument, but actually works on rhetoric and spin and smear. Classic examples would include Tony Blair's speech to the Commons the day before the bombing began in 2003, full of holes as an argument, but surfing the waves of popular feeling, which itself had been whipped up by elements in the media on both sides of the Atlantic, to assume that whatever had caused September the 11th, itself a classic postmodern moment, if we went and beat up Saddam Hussein, that would somehow make it all better. Some of us said at the time that every bomb we dropped would be another recruiting agent for Al-Qaeda. The only mistake there was not to see that behind that horrible movement would be another far worse again. And this is where postmodernity eats its own tail. Because having destroyed the larger meta-narratives that might have explained how and why such movements existed and what they're aiming at, all we have left reporting on the current chaos is that there are very unpleasant people out there and that our only question is, should we go and bomb them or should we try and ignore them? Other features of the modern to postmodern shift include the confusion over Europe, which began as a classic modernist construct, a secular parody of an older European holy empire, and is now under threat of deconstruction as post-modernity, the smaller identities reassert themselves, tell their own little stories. It's been depressing to find nobody explaining our current confusions in these terms, at least I haven't heard it, but instead lapsing back into the easy rhetoric revolving around hot issues like immigration without realizing that the deep level cultural drivers are the things that make them hot in the first place. In other words, yes, there is such a thing as racism, but there are also major narratives which people are intuiting without realizing it, about complex identity. And those major narratives are not addressed by the threadbare neo-moralism in which racism is one of the last remaining sins. Postmodernity then seems to be here to stay, not least because the media thrive on shifting cultural signifiers and thereby instantiate that way of seeing the world in the popular mind. And as I've often said, postmodernity seems to have had the vocation of preaching the doctrine of the fall to arrogant modernity. Fine, but having done that, it has no gospel to follow up with. <clears throat> 
There is no redemption. There is only play. And the play turns out to be a witch's dance on the edge of a volcano as the unaddressed global problems erupt once more and we don't have any story with which to understand them. The second of my three comments about where we've got to is the sheer confusion about religion and indeed that word itself as a symptom of the problem. <clears throat> In the ancient world, religio meant that which binds things together, particularly the binding together of the visible and invisible inhabitants of a polis, a community. In other words, the human inhabitants and the divine inhabitants. Religion is what held things together. Ancient religion was, by definition, the rich and complex interweaving of the gods and the humans, whereas since the breathtaking redefinition of the Enlightenment, religion has been about a detached set of life, separated from politics and the public domain in general. And in the same way, religion was what bound society together as a whole, part of the social glue. Whereas in the modern and now particularly the postmodern world, religion appears as a maker and marker of socio-cultural division, which at best creates an us and them mentality and at worst generates bombings, beheadings, and a thousand other horrors. Because, of course, though we in the modern West have redefined religion as, by definition, that which is precisely not public life, most of the world has seen no reason to go along with that interesting linguistic move, not least because they can see that our redefinition always was self-serving, releasing the West from divine constraint and so freeing it for exploitation and empire. And the fact that sometimes, perhaps with a Protestant suspicion of the word religion itself, sometimes we speak instead of faith communities, that is itself, of course, a nervous Christian construct. It is precisely Christianity, with long memories of St. Paul, that thinks of itself as a faith that has never been the chosen self-characterization of Jews or Muslims, still less of Hindus or Buddhists. Though when they join in the modernist discourse, they do sometimes talk about themselves as a faith and thereby help to make the whole thing even more fuzzy. So my second point then is that precisely within modernism and then postmodernism, the key terms have been corrupted with our confusions so that we hardly know any longer how to name, let alone to address the deep problems that we're facing. I said something about this in a lecture in Glasgow a few weeks ago, which got picked up in the newspapers in Scotland, to the effect that really in our school syllabuses, we ought to be teaching Jesus as part of history, not as part of religion. Because if he's part of religion, he belongs in that little box over on the side, which you do at four o'clock on a Thursday afternoon when everyone's a bit tired anyway. Whereas, of course, whether you believe in Jesus or not, what happened in the first century in Palestine has been massively formative for the whole of world history, and people need to know about that. Mutatis mutandis, this applies to broadcasting, etc. Religion is not just that little bit on the side, etc. Oh, I could go on about this. I'm going to stop. <clears throat> and so the media are inevitably caught up in this, obliged to say something, but robbed of a language with which to say it clearly and cleanly. We are back to T.S. Eliot's lament about words slipping and sliding and not staying in place as the word in the desert is assailed with voices of temptation. The third shift which has been going on for 200 years at least but which has reached new levels in public discourse in my lifetime is the sheer rampant confusion about theology made worse because people don't even know that there is a thing called theology to be confused about. Most commentators don't think they're doing theology, so it's masked, but it's real and powerful. It emerges in the new atheism of Richard Dawkins and so on, and the shrill attempts to push religion or faith out of the public square once and for all with shrill anger about faith schools and knee-jerk reactions to bishops and the lords and all that. You know, yes, declaration, as you know, I was there for seven years, not now. The problem is that the meaning of the word God has shifted in the popular imagination. In my boyhood, I don't think this is just rose-tinted memories, the word God still had some vestigial connection with Jesus. 
with a strange though powerful message of love and hope. Now that's almost entirely gone. And victory is all but complete for the Epicureanism of the Enlightenment, in which God or the gods, if they exist at all, are a long way away, and by definition, never get involved in our world. That was an ancient philosophical position reserved for the rich and the elite. And they could afford it. It's been creeping back into Western modernity ever since Bracciolini rediscovered Lucretius in 1417. And it's become de facto, and in France and America, de jure, as a public perception of God and the world, leading, as it was designed to do, to a practical atheism in which moral restraint was merely prudential, lacking divine sanction, and public expressions of religion, such as parliamentary prayers, seemed a mere category mistake. And this is the point at which when a newspaper or a, a, a radio station employs someone to report on religion, what the editors mostly want, not always, I know, but mostly, is stories which reflect this public mood, seldom if ever showing the thousand positive sides of church or synagogue or mosque life, and instead showing churches and other religious communities as divided, confused, backward-looking, and of course, hypocritical. When Pope Benedict came to Britain six years ago, it was beyond caricature how the media were desperate to talk about sex, while Pope Benedict was equally determined to talk about Jesus. So there are three cultural snapshots. There could, of course, be many more, but I expect you'll recognize them, and I hope we can see that together they cause multiple interlocking confusions. And the confusions are not merely at the level of comprehension. As Marx said, the point is not simply to understand the world, but to change it. And by not understanding the world we live in, we are blundering around simply making matters worse, changing it in fact, but in all the wrong ways. And all this has come to a head in the crisis which has been looming up ever since the Bush-Blair adventure of 13 years ago, which itself showed that we'd learned nothing, and from which we seem to have learned nothing except we don't want to try that again. The trouble is that despite the warnings from diplomats and others who did understand the complexities, the Western powers, led ironically by the only two publicly professing Christians among the G8 leaders, operated out of the shallow modernist narrative according to which you simply have to topple the tyrants and then peace and love and flower power and Western democracy will automatically spring up in their place. That was always a dangerous half-truth when the Americans did it in the late 18th century. It makes no sense whatever in today's Middle East where, as in Iraq, the tyrant in question was our own creation in the first place and where he was at least keeping the lid on the volcano, however unpleasantly. And when the Western leaders five years ago looked at the so-called Arab Spring and declared that it was important to be on the right side of history, they were simply parroting the modernist narrative, assuming a Whig interpretation in which history is inexorably moving towards our Western vision of freedom at the very moment when, as current events show only too worryingly, our great democratic institutions throw up bizarre choices and unthought out new fixed points. It takes a peculiar blindness to imagine today that we in the West understand exactly how the world is and know how to run it, while everybody else is waiting and perhaps even wanting to catch up with our confused mess. The only sense in which that's true is that they are, in fact, literally washing up on our shores, partly because, over the years, our economic and industrial policies and the political and military actions we've taken around the world have made life impossible for many elsewhere. And just as we don't have a narrative to explain why this is happening. We certainly don't have any kind of narrative to suggest what we should do about it. And this is itself the human fallout from the failure of the modernist dream, with all the confusions about God and religion muddled in there somehow. As long as the countries of the Enlightenment could keep the rest of the world at bay, sending the occasional gunboat to sort out the natives or the more frequent cargo ship to bring back diamonds, emeralds, and amethysts, sandalwood and cedarwood and sweet white wine, we could sustain our narrative. But those days are gone, crashing to the ground like the Twin Towers themselves. 
And if our only response is to blame Russia, which has its own quite different and similarly dangerous narrative, and fails to see why it should adopt ours, we are merely refusing to address the real problem. Someone asked me the other day in public, if St. Paul were to write an epistle to Theresa May, what would he say? It's a good question. I'm still working on that. But I think he would want to highlight the fact that we live at a crisis point where multiple worldviews of a dangerous world are like ignorant armies clashing by night. And if the tide of the older faith has retreated from the shore, we have no resources to draw on to understand, let alone address, the things that urgently matter. Now, at this point, I would be stupid to pretend that I had a few rabbits to pull out of my hat that would run around this confusing room and tidy it all up for us. But let's at least try to understand something of a biblical view of how human societies are meant to operate. In my experience, this is not usually well understood, either inside the churches or outside, so that those with Christian faith try to put Christian labels on ideas which come from elsewhere, and those without that faith look at the church and see it muddled and uncertain. And in the middle of all that, with the multiple uncertainties about the task and the role of the church itself, it's not surprising that the media are likewise uncertain, both about what the church's task really is, always supposing it should still be there and not have disappeared with the onrushing on tide of secularism, and about what the media's own task might be and how those two, church and media, might or could or should relate to one another. How they might even perhaps work together instead of appearing to be trying to claim the same little piece of cultural turf. Sorry, the lights just went off then. Doesn't always happen when I'm speaking, does sometimes, but... Um, <laughs> If, if you need more light, then I'm sure you can move to where you can find some. But let me offer you four. There you are, thank you. Let me offer you four central points, which I think have not been well understood, but which might at least clear some ground for discussion. First, the God of the Bible is the God who desires and designs to work through human beings. I invented a new word for that the other day. God is the de-anthropic God, dia and anthropos in Greek. By definition, the God of Genesis, the God of Jesus, is the God who doesn't just create human beings for fun. He creates human beings in his own image to work through them in the world. Think about it. The gods of Epicureanism, if they exist at all, certainly don't want to work in the world at all. The distant God of deism the soft and pseudo-Christian version of Epicureanism, might want to work in the world, but if he did, it would be by occasional sudden interventions, bypassing human agency. The gods of pantheism, as of paganism before it, are simply part of the general life force at work equally in rivers and volcanoes, in eagles and antelopes, as well as in humans. But the biblical god has called his humanoid creatures to reflect him into the world and equally to reflect the inarticulate praises of creation back to him. This is central to the ancient faith of Israel. And this brought into sudden and frightening focus in Jesus and his cross and resurrection is integral to the Christian faith. These points are not well understood. Because if they were, we might have quite a different view of what we call theocracy, the idea of the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven, which is, after all, what Jesus taught his followers to pray for. For us, theocracy, scary, smacks of mad clergy bossing people around and threatening them with hellfire or at least decapitation if they resist. But the question of theocracy is, of course, which theos are we talking about? And if the theos in question is the God we see in the Bible, the God whose perfect self-expression is named as Jesus of Nazareth, then we are faced with what appears to many as an oxymoron, a cruciform theocracy, a cross-shaped rule of God in the world, the rule of self-giving love. And humans are called 
in Scripture to be the royal priesthood, standing between the Creator and the creation, reflecting worship back to God and stewardship into the world. That's a huge general point about biblical anthropology, but it has its sharp, immediate focus in terms of social and cultural and especially political life. Because if this is what the biblical God is like, then it's clear, and the New Testament frequently insists on this, though you mightn't know that, is that this God wants the world to be wisely ordered through human agency. Western modernity has been so afraid of tyranny, partly for historical reasons, but equally because of ideological agendas, that we have been suspicious of rulers as a whole, though we've then flicked back to them under crisis situations. And some in the churches have supposed it is their task, task simply to pull down the mighty from their thrones, rather than to affirm equally the goodness and God-givenness of human structures of government. Human political systems have broadly, as you know, been designed to ward off tyranny on the one hand and anarchy on the other. And though the Bible frequently does warn against tyranny, it's very clear that God does not want or like anarchy. God is the working through humans in his world, God. And human authorities, whether they know it or not, there's some remarkable examples in the Bible of human authorities who have no intention of being God's agents, but they function that way anyway. They have the noble vocation of bringing God's wise order into the world. And the corollary of this, equally clear in Scripture, is that God will hold them to account for how they use that stewardship. And that holding to account, which will one day be clear and complete, must happen already in the present time. And that is the point in the argument at which the specific vocations of church and media come into focus. Come back to that in just a second. So my first of my big four points is that the biblical God is the working through human beings, God. Though the lamentable absence of theological education in the public at large has all but hidden this truth behind the fog of deism or the denials of atheism. But it leads directly to the second point, which is that in the Bible there are maximal and minimal duties of the humans through whom God wants to work in the world. The maximal duties are set out in passages like uh, Isaiah 11 or Psalm 72, the vocation to do justice and mercy, to take special care of the orphan and widow, the sick and the poor, and those who have nobody to plead for them. These are graphically displayed. It would be good for all rulers to have a copy of Psalm 72 pinned up somewhere prominently and to remind themselves of it frequently. Though as soon as I say that, I think of half a dozen other passages I'd like as well. This notice board is going to get rather full. Certainly alongside, as well as Colossians 1 and Philippians 2, they would need to remember the striking saying in Matthew 28, where the risen Jesus declares that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. So that all other, and this is fascinating because, of course, Matthew is written at a time when the church is a tiny minority and being persecuted, etc. But this is what they say. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Doesn't say will be given to him. Doesn't just say in heaven and earth can come later. It's already there. So that all other authority, whether the so-called authority of scripture on the one hand, or the authority of political leaders on the other hand, from a Christian point of view, must be understood as in some sense delegated authority, the means by which cruciform theocracy is to be worked out. And if Psalm 72 and similar passages give us the maximal task to do justice and mercy and look after the poor and the weak and so on, then passages like Romans 13 give us the minimal task. The rulers must keep the peace, must sustain a society in which, very broadly speaking, virtue is encouraged to flourish and vice is kept in check. In particular, some kind of a criminal justice system is necessary, if only because otherwise vigilantism will spring up in its place, a point which, if we think globally, is very necessary just now. That is the logic of the end of Romans 12 and the start of Romans 13. Private vengeance is ruled out, 
because God wants the human authorities to deal with crime. So human authorities are thus poised by the gospel of Jesus between the inaugurated kingdom of God through Jesus himself and the ultimate kingdom in which God's glory and justice will flood the whole creation as the waters cover the sea. And human rulers therefore need to be reminded that their task will only ever be approximate and partial. We have seen in recent decades some disastrously naive experiments in messianism in which rulers suddenly discovered that there was a thing called evil out there and that what they had to do was to sort it out by dropping bombs on it and so on and so on. So along with the vocation to a delegated authority, there must go the necessary humility of knowing that our attempts at justice and mercy, which we must go on making, are never going to be perfect, but that we will be held to account, especially for any arrogant assumptions about our own superhuman powers as rulers. And so here we come, in my third point, to the specific tasks of church and media in relation to the God-given tasks of earthly rulers. And I stress that these God-given tasks apply from a Christian point of view or a Jewish point of view, actually, whether or not the earthly rulers recognize God. Let me start with a word about the media. In the ancient pagan world, I was an ancient historian before I was a theologian, and I kind of lapsed back into Greece and Rome as home territory, really. In the ancient pagan world, there were many political systems and parties. But in the great democracies like Athens and Rome, not that they were full democracies in our sense, but they were trying, and even within some other systems as well, there were well-developed ways in which the wider public outside the immediate political process could reflect on and comment on and critique what the politicians were doing. You see this in the poets, the philosophers, and not least the dramatists, both comic and tragic. Sometimes the roles then overlap as philosophers like Seneca become official advisors to the emperor, in his case, Nero, bad luck, and as at least one philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, became emperor. Sometimes court poets are wheeled on simply to flatter the rulers and boost their public prestige. Of course, that never happens in our modern media, does it? But often, poets and philosophers and playwrights as well were able, nervously perhaps, to hold up a mirror to power, to speak uncomfortable truths in ways that could be heard by a wider public and perhaps, however dangerously, by rulers themselves, whether tyrants or elected. And, of course, many tyrants have come to power on a massive popular vote. And this, it seems to me, is the proper ancestry of the task of the Western media in today's world, to combine the philosopher, the poet, and the dramatist, to tell the truth, or at least one bit of the truth, in the public arena, to raise the awkward questions, to remind both rulers and ruled of dimensions of the problems which might otherwise be swept under the official rug. Of course, there are some newspapers and radio stations which are a bit more like Aristophanes than Sophocles, more like Diogenes the Cynic than like Plato or Aristotle. They also serve. It's part of the deal. And the church, if it knows its business, should respect these various callings and encourage those of its members who have the time and the talents to engage in them, reminding them of their responsibilities and warning them that they too will be held to account for that stewardship. But at this stage in the argument, still within my third of my four big points, we discover that the church itself has a God-given role which often goes unnoticed. It's a central feature of the whole Christian dispensation, the New Testament vision of reality as it's been transformed by the gospel of Jesus, that in this interim time, between the establishment of God's just and wise order in Jesus' death and resurrection and the full implementation of that just and wise order in the ultimate new creation, when the earth shall be filled with God's glory and justice, those who follow Jesus and invoke him as Lord now have a non-negotiable and spirit-driven responsibility to hold the world to account. This is like the ancient world of poets, philosophers, and dramatists. 
but it transcends and in a way supplants that work. And I think if the church and the media are to have any chance of working together wisely and fruitfully in the days to come, it would be as well if this were understood between them, which it certainly has not been. Let me put it like this. The church from New Testament times onwards has been aware of many vocations in the world. The church has never, until the high Middle Ages in the West and thereafter, been about saving souls for a distant heaven. If you go back to the New Testament, the person who teaches that is Plutarch, who's a Middle Platonist, not Paul. That became a convenient siding into which the real gospel could then be shunted by the deists and Epicureans. You just get on save souls for heaven. We will run the world. Stay off our patch. So they told the Christians to get on, to teach people to pray, all that stuff. You're good at that. While we, the power brokers, will carve up the earth undisturbed and uncritiqued. No. The church has always had the vocation to work with and for the poor, to feed the hungry, to bring medical help to those in need, particularly those who couldn't afford it. Nobody else in the ancient world was doing that. We looked at the Christians and said, why, why are you doing that? And they would tell stories about Jesus. And also to bring education to the masses, which again was unheard of in the ancient world. The church has been doing these things for 2,000 years. And though we rightly celebrate our NHS and struggle to improve our public education systems, we do well to remember that the church was doing all that long, long before. And the church has always campaigned for justice in the world, whether it was bishops rebuking emperors for continuing to use the death penalty, a point I enjoy making in a certain country the other side of the Atlantic, or whether it's church groups today who've had some success at least in campaigning for the dropping of unpayable debts which unscrupulous bankers allowed unspeakable tyrants to run up and which have then kept the poorest countries of the world enslaved. You know, the iniquity of this was revealed in 2008 with the financial crash when suddenly governments were bailing out the bankers and the very rich did for the very rich what they had refused to do for the very poor. And the church is, of course, the community that is to hold people's feet to the fire on issues like this, while going on praying for all people, and especially for those charged with exercising human authority. But within these vocations, and growing out of them, the church has the calling to speak the truth to power. When I was in the Lords, it was very interesting, because of course, many people in the Lords don't like the bishops being there. Others actually realize that the bishops are dealing with more people on the street in real life situations day by day and week by week, than most of the other people in both Houses of Parliament. But in John 16, Jesus declares that when the Spirit comes, the Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's a complex little passage. Uh, when I was first ordained, yeah, 40 years ago, thanks for reminding me of that, and um, looking at lessons for the week, if I saw that one coming up, I would quickly choose the Old Testament reading instead to preach on. It was difficult. But at its heart, it insists that the Spirit who is given to the churches, the Spirit will hold the world to it. How does the Spirit do that? By enabling the followers of Jesus to do it, to speak the truth to power. And this, too, is a matter of inaugurated eschatology. That is, God is going to hold the world to account one day at the end when he makes new heavens and new earth in which justice will reign forever. That process has already been launched with the life and ministry and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. As a result, God's standard of what sin and righteousness and judgment really is has been revealed. And in between those two, the church has to implement the latter and anticipate the former by speaking words of truth, words given by the Spirit as people wrestle with the complex issues, naming and shaming wickedness in places both high and low, and calling and recalling the world's rulers to their rightful tasks. This is what cruciform theocracy looks like. The church as it's working with the poor and campaigning for justice and mercy and health and education and wisdom, prayerfully and cheerfully reminding the rulers of this world what their job actually is, whether they want to hear it or not. Many moments in Scripture which I love down this line. Paul in Philippi, 
where he's been slammed into jail on a trumped up charge, beaten up, and then you know the story at midnight, he and Silas are praying and singing hymns as you do in prison when you've been beaten up. And there's an earthquake and the walls fall down and the jailer's about to kill himself and Paul says, no, don't do it, and gets converted and this and that. And then the, in the next morning, the magistrates send a message saying, tell those men to get out of town. And Paul says, <clears throat> Roman citizens, beaten without charge, imprisoned without trial, sounds like a public apology. And he gets it. He's reminding the rulers dangerously of what their job actually is. He does it again in Acts 20. can't stop Paul. He just goes on doing it, even though he gets beaten up. Now, of course, this vocation can be and has been abused, and the church itself needs to have in its midst, midst prophetic and wise voices so that the church itself can be called to account, not least in how it's exercising this vocation. But just because we can and do get it wrong, that doesn't mean we should give up the vocation. We cannot, though, of course, a lot of people would like us to. And there's the rub. There's the rub particularly between the church in its vocation and the media or some elements of the media in its vocation. I've stressed the media really do have a vocation. Going back to the ancient poets and philosophers and dramatists of speaking truth in the public square in a way that can shine an unwelcome and perhaps dangerous light on rulers and their follies. But the church, too, has a vocation of speaking truth to power, which goes all the way back to Jesus' argument with Pontius Pilate in John 18 and 19, or Paul's arguments, which I've mentioned, with officials in Acts. Hence the clash, because many journalists in our own day, precisely because of the cultural and philosophical climates, which I sketched so briefly half an hour ago, strongly believe that the church has no place in the public square. Or if it does, it's only got to be a circumscribed place called religion, carefully screened off from everything else. And many journalists have believed that the job of holding rulers to account, or indeed of commenting on many other affairs of public life, belongs to the media only and not to the churches. So that when the church does try to say something, we get warned off the patch by the secular journalists who have appointed themselves as not only poets and philosophers, but also as high priests of our secular culture. Which brings me at last to my brief fourth and final point. It seems to me that the failure to understand these deep cultural and theological vocations are bound to lead to a clash between the church and the media in which, of course, the many people who belong firmly to both camps, including many of you and me as well, are caught in the middle. And at that point, we cannot simply settle for short-term pragmatism, for muddling through. We urgently need fresh wisdom to map out how the roles work side by side and how they might work together rather than in uncomprehending competition. At the moment, the church has often retreated, browbeaten and sneered at by many in the media, so that the church then creates its own private world, whether liturgical or theological, and only occasionally glances sorrowfully over its high walls at the mess outside. That's how many in the media like to keep it. You stay in there, and we'll do this stuff. Standard enlightenment package, despite postmodernity. No, the church has to recapture the art of spirit-led wise critique, speaking truth to power, holding up the undistorting mirror to the often distorted and distended ambitions and pretensions of the world's rulers. And the church needs to do this with mature wisdom so that it isn't just shooting from a would-be Christian hip at every problem that comes around the corner, but is responding with deep understanding and reflective Christian thoughtfulness. And this is, of course, where wise Christian journalism has a vital role. The church needs to make space and time, and Christian journalists need to make space and time, prayerfully to work together so that the different kinds of critique which we both must bring may be clearly and properly articulated. This is extremely important in a political situation like we have at the moment, with the opposition in disarray and the government itself making things up on the fly. I mention only our own country. Again, don't even go across the Atlantic. 
but it is also vital in a situation such as we had in 2003, where 90% of MPs voted for a disastrous war, which is now one of the many contributory causes to our present multiple crises. The church must speak with wisdom and expertise and not be put off by the neo-atheists or anyone else. And the media must recognize that this is part of what the church is there to do and must find ways of working creatively so that the proper vocations of all may be properly exercised. And if possible, the church itself should seek out and celebrate its own poets, philosophers, and dramatists who, again, like St. Paul in his famous poem in Philippians 2, are able in sharp and memorable phrases to declare under Caesar's nose that Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. This is part of the task of early Christian apocalyptic, to create a glorious, poetically imagined world in which people can glimpse what it might mean to say that on the cross Jesus defeated all the powers of the world, and then to try living within that newly imagined but in fact real world. And if the church's artists, musicians, and poets are to do this for tomorrow's world, musicians, I was in the Barbican the other night when James McMillan premiered his amazing new Starbat Mater. Oh, amazing stuff. If we are to do this, if they are to do this for tomorrow's world, then they will need to know how to use the media itself wisely and well. I'm calling, therefore, from a position of no great high point, for a fresh appraisal of the vocations of church and media alike, rooted in a larger biblical theology of the God of Israel made known in Jesus and the Spirit, and able to address the multiple confusions and sorrows of today's dangerous world. The vocations themselves are dangerous. There's no question about that. We will get things wrong. We will need further internal and external critique and correction. But that's no excuse for not making a fresh start. Thank you. Wonderful, uh, Professor Wright. Thank you so much for giving us um, such a lot of food for thought. I'm, I will ask now, because I'm sure someone will, will the text of your lecture be available for people to digest um, more fully? Yeah, I will um, tidy it up a bit and then put it on somebody's website somewhere and I'll let you know. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with a simplish one. Uh, this is the 40th Church and Media Network Conference. What are uh, some things that have changed in the 40 years between the relationship between the church and the media? One thing for the worse, and I'm going to challenge you, one thing for the better. That's tricky. Um, I suppose that f first many of those 40 years, I, like many, just accepted unreflectively that the way the media did it was the way that the media did it. And I've worked, I've watched steadily the erosion of, for instance, um, broadcast services. Um, but in a sense, that's the, the icing on the cake. And I, I've taken part in a lot of broadcast services myself and have regretted that they only tend to happen at key moments in the year rather than every Sunday. I know people, old people who are shut in who would love it if only there would be a proper service televised on a Sunday morning. And there's a 40-minute service on Radio 4 and that, that's it kind of thing. Um, but that, that, in a sense, is only the icing on the cake. And to you, as a, as a thought for the day person, I mean, I know some while ago people used to say, um, wouldn't it be good if we could have atheists doing thought for the day as well? To which the answer was, the atheists have got the other um, 57 minutes of the, of the hour to themselves, uh, more or less, uh, de facto. And, uh, you know, what are we talking about here? Because I think the question is, why is Christian reflection within the larger media world? And it, instead, I've seen it under the sort of, prevailing forces of secularism shunted off more and more into this corner labeled religion, which by modern definition is that which is not really relevant to the rest of us. So that if I, if I was making, which I, if anyone here wants to produce a series of programs about St. Paul, um, come and have a word with me do because something like that needs to be done. But the problem is that what, it would, what the commissioning folk would do would be say, oh, that's religion, isn't it? Put it in that box. It isn't. It's history. It's philosophy. It's culture. It's politics. It's, it's how the Western world was shaped, for goodness sake. Anyway, so I've seen that sort of steady erosion. Um, there's been some wonderfully creative stuff as well. Some things suddenly pop up, and you find a program. I'm struggling now to think of 
the right example, but I'm sure there are some, and, and because I know that I do sometimes have delightful surprises um, when suddenly something like that happens. It's also, there's, I mean, we need to name and, and reflect on the fact things are very different in other countries. Um, the way that Americans handle religion is totally different from the way that we do mm -hmm. because of their different culture, etc. So, yeah. a start okay. to your question. Anyway. Some, some positive things. Um, you've been uh, very uh, much warmer today about the media in general than um, perhaps is typical of your uh, writings as a whole, particularly the book I'm thinking about is the recent one on, on public religion, and that's great to hear. Um, uh, it's great to hear an encouragement for Christians to be involved uh, in mainstream media. I think that's very much at the DNA of this, this organisation. Uh, but for the many, many people involved in the media who are not Christians, who are on uh, very low pay, very insecure jobs, working in a business model which requires more and more content with less and less time, fewer and fewer resources, that high calling to be a philosopher and a poet and a dramatist, to hold power to account... Um, <coughs> seems less and less realistic, I'll be honest. What might the church do to not just uh, criticize that, those individuals, but to help change that situation? Yeah, it's, it's tough, isn't it? And uh, I mean, the criticism I still think is valid, and I can't now remember which of the essays that I'd done over the last 10 years ended up in that book, God in Public, but um, uh, because they were different essays from different periods, I didn't kind of work back over the whole book and say, is this actually balanced? It was sort of, okay, we're going to run with this. Um, so sorry if there is any apparent um, imbalance or negativity, which is obviously unwarranted. Um, nevertheless, as in general, if you know anything about an actual story and then you read the account in any newspaper, you at once spot where they're getting things wrong. So particularly when newspapers and uh, broadcasters talk about what the church is up to or talk about religion in general, you kind of wince and think, please will somebody just sit you down and explain how this stuff actually works. But who is that somebody? Shouldn't, isn't that well, the fault of the church that um, that's not happening? It, it may be the fault of the church, but I think it's probably six of one and half a dozen of the other because the church has been, has been warned off and particularly has been told, um, you know, we, we don't want you sho shoving our, your religious ideas down our throats. And I told somebody in the green room before about being on the Brains Trust a few years ago with Joan Bakewell chairing it. And one time the question was, if you could choose your religion, which would it be and why? And she came to me first and I began by saying, well, actually, you don't, it's not like that. You don't choose it from a smorgasbord. However, starting from scratch, here are some reasons why Christianity... Adopt. And Joan stopped me and said, oh, Tom, we can't, we can't do that. That's proselytizing. We, we can't do that on the BBC. And the other three members of the panel pounced on her and said, uh, that was the question. You asked Tom to answer it. He has to be able to say why. You know, if I'd said, actually, I'd like to be a, um, a, some variety of Tibetan Buddhist or whatever, I would have been... Well, so you know, th there's a sort of sense that it's not a level playing field. And if the church tries to say this, mm -hmm. it's told, oh, shut up, you know, you go, you belong in the medieval period or whatever. So it is really, really difficult. And of course, mutatis mutandis for many parish clergy who, like your journalists, are on low pay, struggling to do a difficult job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the security is often not really worth <laughs> what it's printed on. Um, so many of them just don't have the time and can't lift their eyes past the immediate crises in the parish or the mm. local community to be able to do this. But some people need to do it. And I suspect that this means that the churches together need to work on this. This is something that uh, there ought to be an economy of scale because actually when the churches get together to say something, then that's actually very powerful. It's when, oh, well, that church says this and that church says that, so we don't need to pay any attention. That, that's a real problem. So I think it's a, it's a matter for... It's actually ecumenical cooperation. Ecumenism works much better when instead of looking across a table and saying, oh, isn't it funny, you believe that and do that and we believe this and do... You know, that, that's just deadly. We've done that for 50 years and it doesn't get you anywhere. But if instead we say, let's actually get together and pray and say, what do we together need to say to the media, to the politicians today? Then there's some some ways forward. Yeah, thank you. Uh, final question from me, and then we'll open up to the floor, so do be thinking about things uh, you'd like to ask Professor Wright. Uh, I want to talk about theocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have in the Theos office a metaphorical theocracy klaxon, uh, <laughs> because you can always tell when an argument about religion in public life is sliding into nonsense when someone uses the theocracy word. It's, it's you know, Bronze Age is another one, Spaghetti Monster, <laughs> You know, you just go, okay, this is not worth our time now. 
and it is obviously um, a very laden word. You've spoken about uh, the precision that we need with language and the difficulty of, say, religion or faith and some of these things. Given that, for most people who hear the word theocracy, they're not either going to hear or understand what you mean by the modifier of cruciform, which is key and really, really does modify the word very significantly. Um, aren't there some things that uh, we just need to avoid in order for our audience to not hear things we're not saying. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I'm unrepentant about this. I've lectured about this from various angles over the last few years, and I, I'm used to this response. And I suppose it comes from my sense, which itself comes from my long-term study of Jesus and the Gospels in their first century context, that most Western Christians, including myself for the first sort of third of my life, never actually thought about what the kingdom of God means, what the kingdom of God looks like, what Jesus meant when he was talking about it, what he was, why he has king of the Jews over his head on the cross and what that means in terms of the cross instantiating the kingdom of God. So we never even understand the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, blessed are the, the peacemakers and the hungry for justice people and so on. We think that that's, oh, these are the virtues I have to aspire to. Well, maybe they are, but actually, it's this is how God becomes king, not by sending in the tanks, but by sending in the poor in spirit and the meek and the merciful and the mourners and the hungry for justice. And by the time the bullies and the bad guys have woken up and realized what's going on, the meek and the merciful and the mourners have built hospitals and schools and are looking after the poor. That's cruciform theocracy. Um, and I just think the idea of God being king, for which theocracy is a literal term, is such a big idea and so regularly forgotten or diminished in the Western world that we need shock tactics to, to do it. And I can well see that in your very sophisticated theos world, that might be tricky. But, you know, I'm a mere New Testament professor. I can get away with it, at least I hope. <laughs> but so so it, it is, I confess it's a deliberate choice, and maybe sooner or later I'll be penitent about it, but I'm, I'm not yet. Okay, thank you very much. Um, who would like to ask a question? Can I just say, please, if you are happy to say who you are, if you have any relevant affiliations uh, try and keep them concise and we want questions not statements if at all possible uh, we're going to go to this gentleman here hi uh, James Poulter from the Lego group we make little plastic bricks um, <laughs> my question for you is um, judging by what's happened in the past 24 hours across that big wet bit to the left um, and also what we've just seen in the recent months and uh, I suppose past couple of years is this degrading or um, devaluing of the fact <laughs> or truth in general. And so just perhaps if you could talk a little bit about how you see this supposed post-truth, post-factual era that we are living in and maybe how the church and how the media should be responding to that in, in which that they can actually bring forward a kind of kingdom mentality into kind of public discourse. Wow. Um, Enlighten me, I haven't watched the news for the last 24 hours. Has anything dramatic happened that I should know about? There's a, a rather, there's a rather abhorrent chap who seems to be saying an awful lot of things that seem to be based in was, very was there anything? There chat. wasn't anything significantly new. There was no, 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 just so, more of the no, same. Just more of the same. Okay, 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 right, right. Just checking. I mean, you never know. He's um, not going to accept the uh, results of the election if it goes the wrong way. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> oh, well, well. Um, I mean, see, a part, part of the problem is the failure of Western democracy, and lots of people have written about this. This isn't me banging on this. It's, it's now widely obvious, and we're seeing this at the moment. You know, like Parliament says, let's have a referendum, so then people don't like the result, and they say, oh, Parliament should decide it. Wait a minute. If Parliament says we'll have a referendum, this cannot mean we're just taking a straw poll, etc., etc. But people just don't understand how the logic of democracy works, and in particular, the way that our democratic institutions have developed in what John Milbank called the biopolitical just developing under their own steam has done all kinds of crazy things and we all just lie back and put our paws in the air and say oh, well we believe in democracy so this must be all right and actually I think we all know that some of the results of democracy are things that most people most of the time really do not approve of we don't have a narrative as to how to get beyond that because of da 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 where we've come from but then how does the church speak truth and truth because the church must not although sometimes it heaven help us tries to 
lapse back into a kind of rationalist modernism where, oh, we know the truth, so we're just giving you the facts straight. You know, in my youth, the one newspaper that claimed it was giving you the facts straight was the official organ of the Communist Party. Um, uh, truth in the New Testament is something that happens when, again, back to God's purpose to work in the world through humans, when humans riskily and humbly name things that are going on in the world and so bring about new possibilities. This is truth poised between creation and new creation, if you like. So you can't go back to the modernist facts, but nor do we dare stay with the postmodern deconstruction of all facts because actually, for most people in the world, most of the time, there are lines drawn in the sand, and saying, oh, I believe in the death of the author, so these don't really matter, just doesn't cut it. You cross that line and you're dead. Um, and it's, it's that playing on the edge of the volcano, as I said, which postmodernity has done, which has allowed them the crisis and the fact that we don't know what to do about it, the refugee crisis, etc. So I think reconceiving how we name and do truth is a major task, not just for a few philosophers, but for the whole church. Thank you. Uh, over to this gentleman in the middle. Uh, Tim Lavelle, work at the BBC. Um, how should American Christians vote? <laughs> Wisely. Prayerfully. Um, part of the problem is that politics isn't, in fact, about choosing a messiah. Um, politics is the resolute pursuit of the least bad. And part of the difficulty for Americans, like the French actually, in quite a different mode, but similar, okay, because basically the Enlightenment thought, we'll get rid of all those silly old tyrannic systems and the church and all that, and then we will have liberté, égalité, fraternité in France. Trouble was they had to guillotine a lot of people to prove the point. And ditto in America, we, we, we are now the, the great world democracy. Therefore, what we do, it kind of messianizes itself. So then they're always disappointed because we had this great celebration and then this chap didn't turn out to be the messiah after all. Um, and we've had small-scale versions of the same thing in the UK. Um, so I think voting for... If, okay, if these are the options, it seems to be fairly obvious which way I would vote. That is not to say that I agree with everything Mrs. Clinton has said or will say or has done or will do, because I don't and won't. But it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, woman in the back row. Hi, Tom. It's Lisa here. Um, we're going to be discussing um, the way that Christians are actually viewed um, in society a little bit later. But there's one thing that, um, that's really struck me. There seems to be a real degree of snobbery and in the media, whereby the secular media and secular journalists uh, seem to be taking a bit more seriously than Christian journalists, and, uh, and also even by high-profile Christians as well, perhaps prefer preferring to be interviewed on the BBC, BBC Radio 4. How do you think that this should be addressed, um, is my first question. Do you think it will change? And what advice would you give to Christian journalists and press officers as well? Wow. Great questions. I don't know that I have good answers. I mean, in my previous two or three jobs, I did many more interviews and so on than I do now. I'm sort of safely up in Scotland teaching people New Testament and playing golf, and, and, and I, don't get, I don't get as many phone calls as I used to, which is just fine by me. Um, but I always did used to think it was incredibly hitty-missy, and it was as though somebody had a list of people they were going to phone and just depending on who happened to be around and pick up the phone, they might or might not do an interview. So I, I'm not sure that I detected the kind of snobbery of the sort that you mean, but maybe it was there and I just didn't realise it. Um, and my sense is that a lot of broadcasters and journalists are working very fast, trying desperately to produce something, and if they can find somebody to give them a, a quote, whether a Vox Pop quote or, a, or an arch archiepiscopal quote or something, then they'll, they'll grab it and run with it. Um, I don't, I'm not really addressing your question. Do you, do you want to rephrase that? Because I, I just don't have a sense that I'm actually in much of a position to, to nail it. In my experience, I've worked at BBC World, BBC News Channel, yeah. Radio 5 Live. I now work at Premier Christian Radio. And I, 
when I've, um, when I, at one point I was actually straddling the two, I was um, working part of my week at Premier Christian Radio, and the other part of my week I was working at the BBC, and I must say there was a distinct, um, there was a distinction when I introduced myself working for the Christian right. media than working at the BBC. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, I think that is simply one aspect of late flowering secularism which is deeply regrettable and which I would love to think we can get over. I mean, I mentioned James Macmillan's new piece and I was thrilled to sit there in the Barbican and see in a full Barbican program with Harry Christopher's and the 16 and so on, the program note where James Macmillan was saying that all his life, the last three days of Jesus' life and the crucifixion have been absolutely central to him and here's this music and here he is, you know, great composer, etc. We, the churches need to reclaim cheerfully public space of all sorts. While that is denied us, Christian radio stations, Christian magazines, etc., are necessary. They're probably necessary anyway, probably a good thing anyway. But if the rest of the world sees we're doing that, okay, you go and play in that corner. And, and, uh, and, and we'll run the real world in, in the real way. So I'm not saying that Premier and so on, for whom I have very high regard, and I've worked with them quite a bit, I'm not saying that they shouldn't exist. I'm saying that actually we do need to find ways of sustaining a presence in the wider media. And there are many people who've done that very successfully, but often by going under the radar for a bit, whatever it may be. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it, it is a tough world, and I, I've worked with many people in those worlds and, and have admired them for trying to hang on to, to something there, but I, I see the point you're making. Uh, we're going to group a few to make sure we try and uh, get as many as possible, so if we could do these two in the middle block, one after the other, please. Uh, Tom, thanks very much for what you had to say. Um, I can see how that would apply to people who may have opinion columns or contributing to op-ed pages or covering religion specifically. But what, how would you apply what you have to say to people that are general reporters, maybe writing about sport or business or interviewing celebrities? It's, um, you know, the jobs where you are just paid to voice your opinion are quite few and far between. Could we uh, follow up with this one and then yeah. get you to answer both? Bit of a different question. Um, I'm Steve G. Jones from World Watch Monitor, writes about uh, Christians under pressure for their faith. Uh, my question is about Islam. I'd like some pointers really on, uh, from your perspective, how best the church and the media, uh, Christian media particularly, should speak about, deal with Islam. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sorry, that, that question is coming so hard. That one was about... Um, yeah. yeah, I was just asking how you'd apply what you had to say to people that are just general oh, yeah, reporting. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Um, I've noticed going to and fro between Britain and America an interesting thing that an ordinary story being reported in the British media almost always has a little bit of a twist, a little bit of a spin, often a little bit of cynicism about it. And you go and read even the New York Times, Washington Post or whatever, you read a long story, and as a Brit you're kind of waiting for the, for the twist, for the knife in the ribs. It never comes. Um, they just don't do that. Um, I mean, sometimes they do, but, but often it's just it's called a straight... Of course, there is no such thing as a straight story. There is no such thing as a point of view which is nobody's point of view. There is no such thing as an epistemological Switzerland where you can be neutral and describe everything from a vantage point. So all people are reporting from within their own worldview and maybe engaging with other worldviews, but to be self-aware about that worldview... Um, I mean, you mentioned sport. If, if I am reporting on a football match in Newcastle and Sunderland, I am not neutral. I'm sorry. Um, I'm black and white through and through. Um, that's just how the world is. But on many issues, I, I have a point of view. And if I was writing the story, all writing of stories involves selection and arrangement. And all selection and arrangement happens from somebody's point of view. That's why history is not a neutral science. That's why history is a public activity. And so I think to be self-aware about that. And yeah, there are many, many things where there isn't a particularly Christian angle, but there may be human wisdom to be cultivated and to be, to be brought to bear on that. And I think that's what one should aim at. And then if you get the chance to develop into a fully blown kind of op-ed writer, then, wow, that's a tremendous opportunity. There's a guy called Ross Douthat who does that on the New York Times, amazing contemporary Christian writer doing a dangerous and difficult job there. Um, 
Islam, I'm not an expert on Islam. I've twice done the things that Rowan Williams organized, the Christian-Muslim dialogues, and I've thoroughly enjoyed them. Part of the difficulty with that is that the Muslims who are prepared to dialogue are in the nature of the case, Muslims who are prepared to dialogue. And one is always aware as you talk to them that they are actually representative of one slice, often a Western slice, of a modern version of Islam, and that there are lots and lots and lots of other versions of Islam, just as there are many varieties of Christianity. So it's very, very difficult and dangerous to generalize. And I think one of the problems there is that so many people in the West seem to think about Islam if only they would realize that religion is just a private hobby that you do once or twice a week and that it needn't affect the rest of real life, then we would all be happy, wouldn't we? Which is a victory for the 18th century enlightenment and tells us actually nothing about either Islam or Buddhism or Judaism, let alone Christianity. So there is a real, real problem there. And wise dialogue is the way to go about it at every level. And the way to make sure you don't have wise dialogue is to go and drop bombs on people and kill villagers, etc. That set us back 50 years. Thank you. Uh, there are a few hands up over here again. If we could uh, go to the um, lady a few rows back in the mint green. Um, and then if we could take these two at the front, and I think that's probably going to be all that we've got time for, and I can make a note of them if that's helpful. Really, uh, for, I wanted to follow up the question about um, how Christians can be salt and light in the media by simply highlighting that biblical phrase, salt and light. How can Christians be salt and light in the secular media? It's a question that needs to be asked and addressed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And then uh, two at the front here. This is an unaffiliated question. Um, breakfast now means breakfast. How can we love our neighbor when our neighbor voted differently from us about something that apparently is incredibly important? <laughs> um, I, it seems to me that what you're talking about essentially is, is church and media um, working prophetically together. You only used the word prophetic once that I noticed, but maybe it was more than once. Um, but it seems to me that the, the, the Old Testament notion of, uh, of the prophet, which continues on into the, to the New Testament, is, has been lost to a very large extent from the, the modern church. We don't understand the Old Testament prophets, uh, and our view of prophecy is, is somewhat devalued. I wonder if you could comment on how we recover that, that, that Old Testament sense of, of the prophet, which yeah. is speaking truth to power. And yeah, so absolutely. On. Great, great, great question. Um, Salt and light, all Christians are called to be salt and light all the time, and obviously every vocation has its own particular modes for how that works. And it runs from everything to a wise, prayerful approach to life and an attempt to inhabit and, as one can, to articulate a wise Christian worldview, which isn't just a sort of off-the-peg thing from 50 years ago or whatever, but a thought-out, careful um, perception runs from that all the way through just to, to, to how you treat people, basically. And uh, I remember being on a panel with somebody um, and when we were all asked the question, how can you sum up the gospel in one phrase, this other clergyman said, um, do you know the name of your milkman? Now, we none of us have milkmen anymore, milk men anymore, <coughs> milk women, but there was something there about how do you treat people? Um, do you actually care about people? And people notice when you care about them. And they wonder why you do, because nobody else cares in that. And so it, all the way from the major worldview issues to the very immediate personal things and everything in between. And in particular, it seems to me, there will be some times when some journalists can say to some other journalists, it was a shame that you wrote that story that way, because actually that was mean, that was a bit spiteful, whatever. And there might have been a different way to write that. And who knows how to say that when editors are barking at you to get the story with all, all its sharp edges, um, etc. But it seems to me there's something to be said about that. In terms of referendums and so on, I mean, we had this in Scotland before we all had it with, with, um, with the recent referendum. And I think one of the things we should have all learned by now is that parliamentary democracies and referendums just don't belong together. This is a silly way of behaving. These were short-term pragmatic solutions, and the perpetrator has suffered the consequences. And... Uh, uh, what you do with that, with our friends in Scotland who voted for Scottish independence uh, 
um, when Maggie and I voted to, to stay. At least I think we did, I'm not sure. Maybe my wife voted the other way, um, <laughs> because sometimes her main thing is to vote the other way from what I do, whatever the issue, but that's, that this is, um, <laughs> that, that's a whole other issue. Um, but but th these are passionately held things. And as part of the difficulty of asking a key question suddenly is that you do polarize people. And a referendum which is supposed to settle things, in fact, stirs up all kinds of unnecessary mud off into the bottom of the pond. And there might have been wiser ways of doing that. And so building reconciliatory bridges and saying, OK, we are where we are. Now what do we do? Um, that's, that's what has to happen. And that lead has to come from the top. And you know, that's why we need to pray for those who are, who are doing that. And the third question is prophecy. Yes, the word prophecy, I guess, was kind of hovering over my lecture. Um, I think, in a way, it's been overused in some circles. You know, I've heard so often somebody say, well, so-and-so has a prophetic ministry, and then you discover what they're actually doing is shouting rather loudly opinions which come straight out of one particular brand of newspaper or whatever, and I kind of rein back from that. However, what I was talking about was, of course, yes, speak, I mean, prophecy is a specific example of what runs through the human vocation all the way from Genesis 2 where the humans are told, Adam is told to name the animals. Prophecy is speaking uh, words in obedience to God which bring fresh God-given order into the world. And sometimes that order is in the form of warning, sometimes dire warning, sometimes it's in the form of encouragement, often it's simply in the form of shedding a new and truer light on a murky area which hasn't been seen like that before. Um, so I would want to take the notion of prophecy back and talk about the way that human beings in general use words, then the way that churches have to use words in obedience to God, um, which, again, T.S. Eliot, is always difficult and dangerous. The endless quest, the words that don't stay in place, and then that lovely resolution at the end of the four quartets and every word and sentence that is right. Sometimes there are times when it does work. And when you know that this word has found you, has named what's actually there, that's a lovely moment. Um, and when I read John's Gospel about the word becoming flesh and then about that stuff in chapter 16 about speaking truth to power, I think, yeah, that's what we should be praying for, actually, all the way through. Professor Wright, thank you so much. Uh, you. Join me in a round of applause as Andy comes back up to take over. <laughs>